Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to church this morning on our Zoom presentation. I pray that God will bless us as we spend time with one another today and that he will give us uh, the blessing that we need or we want and we desire for, for this Sabbath day as we, we spend time together in his word. And we've already read a, listened to a beautiful Sabbath school lesson about our, how amazing our body is and how God wants us to look after it and the, the wonderful laws he's given to, to help us to look after it as well. And so we're going to have a presentation very soon from Shelley that's going to, um, again, go through how amazing our body is and the wonderful laws that God has given us. So I'm going to play a hymn now. Or actually, it's not a hymn. It's just a, a Sabbath song. And just give me a second and I'll I'll put it on the I won't put it on the screen. It's just a a, a present a um it's just a song, so there's no no slides or anything, so I'll just play the song. And the song is called The Sabbath Song. And the singer is called Daryl Sawyer. I've met him myself. He's a godly man who loves loves the lord and loves the loves the truth and he also loves the health message as well so um i'm just going to play the song it's called the sabbath song mm -hmm. Proclaim this day to be the best for the world was created within six days. God rested on the seventh, and to man he said, Come unto me. When we 
was a, a beautiful hymn and uh, so well so much to say about the Sabbath so I'd like to um I've invite or ask uh, brother Lavino if you'll be able to um, open in prayer for us brother yeah let's kneel shall we Dear merciful and loving Father God in heaven, as we approach your throne of mercy in this amazing Sabbath, we are so thankful for your love and tender mercy. Thank you so much, your Lord, for your faithfulness upon each and every one of us. Thank you for the Sabbath schools that remind us that um, of everything that we need to acknowledge that you provide everything in order for our body to be sustained for your work. And Lord, as we come together as a family once again to study your word through the divine service, I humbly pray for the double portion of thy Holy Spirit upon Brother Michael that he will present your message for us. And also our Sister Shelley, dear Lord, that present to us the health message uh, in order to prepare ourselves as a living sacrifice for you. So Lord, I ask for thy blessing upon both of them. And I also pray for your people today as we listen to your voice. I humbly ask that you please open our hearts to receive your message, to help us in this time that we're living, dear Lord, is a time of troubles ahead of us. But our lives need to be prepared, to need to be ready to receive the latter rain and also to stand in a time of troubles ahead of us. So I pray that's each and every one of us, that we should humble ourselves before you. Help us to deny self. Help us to take our cross daily and follow you. So, Lord, as we continue on our service this Sabbath, I humbly pray, dear Lord, for forgiveness and cleansing of our sins. We pray our minds and our hearts to receive your word. Cast out any evil spirits, dear Lord, that we will try to distract our service today. And let thy blessing be upon each and every one of us. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so um, just give us a minute and we're going to hand over to Shelley and her presentation but we're just going to do something quickly for a sec. So hang on a sec. Okay, hang on. Okay. Okay. Um, 
All right, now I'll hand it over to uh, Shelley. All right. Thank you for that prayer, Davina. It's beautiful. So um, I just want to open up with this quote in the Bible from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Our bodies are made from the dust of the ground. You know, scientists have discovered that the 59 elements found in the human body are all found on the Earth's crust. Now, if that isn't proof and evidence that God has created us from the dust of the Earth. So I am going to talk on one of those elements that are actually in the soil that are very important for our bodies. Let's see if anybody's taking it. It's called fulvic acid. Now, during the question and answers, I'd like to know if anybody has heard of this fulvic acid or has taken it and what the results have been. So fulvic acid is one component of humus. Humus is made of many organic compounds found in the earth's soils, rock sediments, and bodies of water. Fulvic acid, is created by gradual decomposition of ancient plants that turns it into super mineral dense. So definitely the plants, even before the flood, have a lot of mineral dense in them. But I don't know if we have too many in that area. I don't know if we have too many though. But anyways, over the past several decades, we've learned a lot more about how fulvic acids found in dirt can actually improve human gut health and therefore immune functions. Today, people supplement with fulvic acid, as well as soil-based probiotics to replenish what is being lost in their diets and lifestyles due to modern farming techniques. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of uh, fulvic acid in our soil because of what they have done to it. While people used to obtain higher amounts of humic acids naturally from the soil, today they often turn to food-grade supplements. So what does fulvic acid from microbes eating rotting plants got to do with you and me? So this is why it's important that you have worms in your soil, okay? Because they help to turn the plants rotted so you have more microbes. Now, fulvic acid is an extremely powerful antioxidant. It renders free radicals. It's harmless by either restoring them into usable compounds or eliminating them as waste. Fulvic acid is a powerful detoxifier. It scavenges heavy metals, which the, um, the last presentation I spoke on was heavy metals. So this is another one that's very important to eliminate heavy metals out of your diet and detoxifies pollutants, which that's very important because we have so much pollution everywhere around us. It has up to 102 trace minerals. That's a lot of minerals and very important for good health. It has polyphenols, which sometime I'm going to speak on that in another time, electrolytes, antioxidants, amino acids, and peptides. But how does folic acid work? Well, it's full of many types of minerals and nutrients that people today are missing. Research suggests that something unique about folic acid compared to other organisms found within soil that is able to easily pass through your cellular membrane. So this allows it to be properly absorbed and also boost assimilation of other nutrients or supplements. So it's very important in your body to have, so it helps to assimilate your minerals easier. So you can take it in addition if you're already taking minerals. In fact, there are benefits of fulvic acid for plants, soil, fertilization, water, and agriculture. So what I recommend is to add this into your soil when you're growing your plants. Supplementation for the same reason it benefits humans because it improves plants ability to grow due to how it increases permeability of the plant membranes absorb nutrients from the ground. So if you put it in your soil, then you will get it into your body. And that's what actually folic acid looks like. You see that color. And I'm actually wearing that color. 
is able to improve how our cells use things like antioxidants and electrolytes. We know how important electrolytes is. It's become popular for slowing down aging. Well, we all need that, don't we? Improving digestive health and protecting brain function. So it helps with the digestion and the brain. In fact, studies now show that folic acid has antioxidant, neuroprotective, antimicrobial, and anti-inflammatory properties. So it has a lot of properties that we need for good health. Folic acid is so powerful. Now listen to this. A single molecule, not many, a single molecule can transport more than 60 times its own weight in minerals and other nutrients into the cells. Folic acid makes nutrients more absorbable. It maintains cellular integrity and aids in the cellular detoxification process. This results in folic minerals having a potentially large impact on body health. It also helps to remove copper, which is very important because if you get too much copper, it can cause depression. And how you can get too much copper is through your water. If you're using, if it has copper pipes. Now, folic acid optimizes the process of transporting the nutrients to cells by carrying minerals and other ingredients across the body. Your organism stays protected from inflammation. And because the folic acid helps with alkalizing the body. And that is very important that our body stays alkaline, especially through all these viruses, these variants, everything they have out there that we can really prevent from a lot of these um, taking over our body by keeping it alkaline. So remember, your pH is very important that you have it balanced. This sets a proper defense from harmful bacteria such as fungus and other organisms damaging your health. In the long run, the folic acid helps with appetite regulation, maintains healthy immunity, and supports better stress management. Oops, sorry. These are some benefits and uses. It creates an immunomodulation effect. So that means it regulates the immune system where there is too much immune system too much inflammation or not enough, it can help bring it to normal level. And that's very important, brothers and sisters, that we do keep inflammation so low in our bodies because that's what creates so much diseases. It can also help the kidneys. It acts as a diuretic, which pulls fluid out. And it also helps regulate your blood pressure. It improves gut health and immune function. The compounds found in folic acid help nourish the digestive tract and also boost the ability of good bacteria. And I was telling you how important you got to keep, you have to have that good bacteria in your gut. And that good bacteria is also important for the brain. So it, you want to repopulate and form a healthy microbiome environment. So you need a strong digestive system to build a strong immune system. Because 76% of your immune system is where? In the gut. And that helps control hormone production, regulate your appetite, reduce stress response, and much more. As a result of gut permeability, and I've gone through that, what is gut permeability? Leaky gut. So when particles are able to escape through the gut lining and enter the bloodstream where they shouldn't normally be, inflammation is triggered. And now you have autoimmune reactions. So remember, the more good microbiome you have in your gut, then you'll have less inflammation and you won't have autoimmune, which is going rapid in our society. So there is some evidence that consuming folic acid helps decrease digestive disorders such as SIBO, which is small intestine bacteria overgrowth, inflammatory bowel disorders, bacterial infections, respiratory, urinary tract, flu, and common colds. It helps boost digestion and nutrient absorption. Acquiring enough electrolytes and other trace minerals is important for proper metabolic functions, digestive health, and nutrient assimilation. So this is very important that you have trace minerals 
and you have your electrolytes. Organisms we obtain from fulvic acid can be taken in small doses and still cause fast, significant improvements in the ratio of bacteria living in the gut. So this helps lower unwanted digestive symptoms, which a lot of people have, like constipation, bloating, diarrhea, and food sensitivities. Now, it also protects cognitive health. And if you are impaired with cognitive health, what could you have? Alzheimer's disease. So a 2011 study published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease found that fulvic acid has several antioxidants, nutraceutical properties with potential activities to protect against cognitive impairments, including Alzheimer's disease because they have found aluminum deposits in plaguing in Alzheimer's patients. Also, autistic children. Now, where do we also find high amounts of aluminum in? The vaccines. I'm talking every vaccine you've taken has aluminum in it and also this poison, this uh, COVID poison that we want to give to people now. A contributing factor to the development of cognitive disorders is free radical damage. Also a type of a protein called tau. Has anyone here heard of tau? I haven't, it's new to me, but there's been new studies now that fulvic acid lowers the length of tau fibrils. If you see those squiggly <coughs> little lines around the area, um, in the picture by the purple, look like little grapes, those are tau proteins. You don't want those because those will create Alzheimer's disease. So folic acid helps disassemble their performance and stopping the disease progression. Isn't that fascinating? And right from where? The soil. Oops. So it also lowers free radical damage and inflammation, which I've gone through that. But folic acid contains antioxidants that counter the effects of free radicals and also help detoxify the bodies of many toxins that contribute to the problem. Chemicals used in agriculture, radioactive waste, and heavy metals. Remember how important it is to get rid of heavy metals out of your diet. For example, it also helps extend the permeability and the life of cells by providing electrolytes that have numerous functions within the heart, muscles, brain, and digestive tract. Improves energy levels and lowers pain. Many people taking fulvic acid supplements have reported improvements in energy levels, probably due to increased detoxification, lower levels of inflammation and free radical damage, and higher intakes of electrolytes and other key nutrients. So remember, it's very important to keep your electrolytes balanced. An electrolyte is soluble in water and works by conducting electrical currents helping cells survive in the face of damage caused by things like emotional stress, uncontrolled infections, unbalanced diet, prolonged loss of sleep, and surgical shocks. Given the fact that electrolyte imbalance can cause chronic pain to worsen. Okay, so if you have an imbalance of electrolytes and you know these symptoms are worsening, you know why. Volvic acid can also support the healing process and lower pain levels such as headache, joint pain, caused by arthritis or bone and muscle pains associated with aging. So God has given it to us already, all from the soil to our food. Now there's some evidence that folic acid electrolytes can help reduce swelling, decreasing inflammation, soothe, relax muscles, improve circulation. Conversely, an electrolyte imbalance can cause these symptoms to worsen. See all these yummy foods? So who remembers what gives you the highest potassium avocados. Why take a fulvic mineral supplement? Now, once you see this picture here, it's called vasculitis, okay? What that is, is that it's an inflamed vessel lining. Do you know many people who've taken these jabs, this COVID um, poison is actually getting this? I don't know if you saw images of people sending these around, but it's just horrific. 
Anyways, they have found that fulvic acid has helped it. There was actually a gentleman named Jonathan Ott. I don't know if you've ever heard about him, but he is actually an Aussie, but he has many different series he's had on lately and has been very, very good. And I highly recommend to listen to them if you can. There was a lady who actually had vasculitis from the jab and she was, they were gonna amputate her legs, but she took the fulvic acid and it reversed it. So, and it's very good also to take for, to help with your mineral supplement as well, promotes better absorption. And these, this is a way how you can take it. Most is through liquid, 12 drops at a time with 16 to 20 ounces of filtered water, not tap water. It's recommended that you use fulvic acid with filtered water. You can take it a half an hour before eating or two hours after eating to improve detox abilities. If using medications, you take fulvic two hours after or before. Chlorine interacts with humic acids in a negative way. So always use filtered water if possible. Is a risk? Yeah, there's some. They say that if people do have autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, they should be monitored. It can activate the immune system and complicate your condition. Because not enough is known about how it affects hormones in pregnant women, it's also best to stay away from using folic acid supplements if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. However, through the dirt, it's fine. So some people claim that they experience folic acid detox symptoms when beginning supplementation. They might experience temporary diarrhea, cramps, fatigue, headaches, or nausea. But that's different for everyone. Now, which foods contain fulvic acid? Organic vegetables. That's right. So grow your own food so you get organic. Because uh, if you buy it, it can be pretty pricey. But according to an article titled Fulvic Acid, is this the missing natural nutritional link by natural matters? The use of farming chemicals like pesticides drastically reduce the amount of fulvic acid and other minerals present in soil. Since organic farmers don't use pesticides or other chemicals, organic vegetables are far more likely to contain fulvic acid than non-organic vegetables due to the diversity of soil. There's no simple way to measure the amount of fulvic acid in vegetables. Um, the best option is organic vegetables that grow directly in soil, such as your potato and rashes and other root veggies. Did you know blackstrap molasses actually has a good force of good source of fulvic acid? I didn't. Do you know why? Because it grows six and a half to 15 feet below the soil. So the depth of the roots ensures that they come in contact with fulvic acid. At some point in the growing process, blackstrap molasses is a thick, syrupy substance often used as a sweetener. It's also very good for your B vitamins and iron. Now this is interesting, shilajit. Shilajit is a substance derived from rocks in the Himalayan mountains. You see in the picture, what they're facing is the Himalayan mountains. According to Natural News, since it is mainly made up of folic acid, the fulvic, sorry, the terms are often used synonymously. Shilajit is most frequently sold in a powder form in health food stores. It does have a bitter taste, but as they say, bitter the better. Now, I just wanted to add this in. This is very good for you men. Dr. L. Sears, he says, this is of the mineral boron. It's used to be in the fruits and vegetables you eat, but commercial farming has depleted our soil. For many of the minerals, you need to stay healthy, and boron is a big player. Your prostate needs it to stay happy and healthy. A man who lives to age 80 has a 90% chance of having an enlarged prostate gland. Boron helps to maintain your prostate gland at the normal size. So this is important for you guys, so don't miss out because boron um, is, in, is in the fulvic acid. So if you add fulvic acid, you will get boron and you will keep your prostate healthy. This living God is worthy of our thought, our praise, our adoration. As a creator of the world, as a creator of man, we are to praise God. For we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Our substance was not hid from him when we were made in secret. His eyes saw our substance, yet being imperfect, and in his book all our members were written, 
when as yet there was none of them. He breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. The inspiration of God has given us understanding. And there's also in Genesis 2, 7, in Psalms and Job. And just, I just want to come in, you know, just to a closing. I just praise God so much for all these wonderful substances given to us, these minerals, these vitamins and everything. So we can keep our bodies healthy if we apply them into our lives. So I just pray, brothers and sisters, that we grow our own food because we know how important it is and organically so that we can get all these wonderful properties that God has given us. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for that, Shelley. Now, just give me a minute, another second, brethren and sisters. I'd like to um, just check something out, play another, see if I can play another song, another hymn. Now, it's amazing the things that God gave us in Genesis chapter mm -hmm. 1 and 2 are still as important for us today as they were when God created us. Okay, let me just find a, a hymn. I was going to play another song, but I've, I've decided to change it and play something else. Okay, so I'm going to play this song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And this, I, I like this. There's two v different versions in our hymnal. Um, both are nice, but I, I like this one. Thank you. 
beautiful hymn. So um, I'm not going to do a Free Angels message presentation today because, as I said, I'm working on a, a presentation and I want to get it right before I present it to you. And I still haven't quite got it right because it, it's going to be a, a special presentation I want to do in two parts. And I still haven't got it right, got it right yet. So, and the next time I next time I'm on in two weeks' time, I'm going to be doing a, a special presentation on on that Sabbath. So we won't get into our um, three angels messages presentations again until the first Sabbath of May. So, hope you don't mind that. But I have a a message today that some of you may have heard. Maybe Lavino might have heard this and. And maybe Craig, and I'm pretty sure my wife has, and probably Shigitu and her family might have heard it as well. But I'm pretty sure no one else has heard this. So I pray that it'll it'll be a blessing for you. I'll just get it up on the screen. So today, we're going to look at two similar but very different animals and the roles they play in our salvation. So turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs 26 and verse 3. So we're going to be actually looking at Bible verses in our sermon today. So usually my sermons, we all the verses are on the screen, but Today we're going to be actually looking through the scriptures, which I'm sure you'll appreciate. <laughs> so Proverbs 26 and verse 3 says, A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. So here in this chapter, uh, verse, sorry, there are two uh, animals mentioned. And those animals are a donkey or an ass and a horse. So this is what my message today is going to be about, a donkey and a horse. Okay, so let's um, just go back to here. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before your throne of grace this morning on your holy Sabbath day. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit will bless us as we open up the scriptures and as we learn about these two animals and what they mean for us and for the salvation that you came to give us. We pray, Father, that you will bless the presence of your angels and that we'll have uh, the fellowship with your, you and your Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to look at a donkey to begin with. Genesis 22, 1 to 18. We're not going to look at these verses, um, but you can write them down and, and go and study them yourself. But it's about the story of Abraham, God telling Abraham to take him, take Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. So God said to Abraham, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, in verse 2. So Abraham saddled his ass and laid the wood on it, in verse 3. And then they journeyed to the place where God told them that God directed them to go. They didn't even... And so once they got there, Abraham told his servants to abide ye here with the ass. In verse 5. And Isaac said, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? In verse 7. Now Abraham replied, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. In verse 8. God said to Abraham, after Isaac was on the altar, and he submitted to, to what Abraham was going to do. And he, because uh, Alan White says that Isaac could see that this was the will of God, even though they both didn't understand what was happening. So Abraham is ready to slay Isaac. And then God said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, in verse 12. And they sacrificed a ram instead, in verse 13. And the place where Abraham went to was called Mount Moriah, and we read that in verse 2. So keep that in mind as we go through our study today. This is the first recorded instance in the Bible of a donkey, an ass, or a mule. This ass carried the material for, a, for the burnt offering that Abraham was commanded by God to sacrifice his only son Isaac with. 
this offering was a parable in type of what God was going to do for mankind. Now, Numbers 22, verses 21 to 35. This is the story of Balaam and his donkey. And so let's look at some points here. So again, I, uh, Balaam saddled his ass in verse 21. And God was angry with Balaam, and the angel of the Lord became, became his adversary with a drawn sword, verse 22 and 23. Three times Balaam's ass saved him from death, verses 22 to 27. Balaam's ass, because of Balaam's stubbornness, Balaam's ass then spoke to him saying, what have I done to thee? Verse 28. Balaam wanted to kill him. Even after the Balaam's ass spoke to him, Balaam wanted to kill his ass. And like, you think Balaam would have gone, huh? why is my ass talking to me? But he was in such a rage that he, he did not even comprehend what was happening. The ass then said to Balaam, in, this is a, a, a paraphrased version of it, as in the way I, I say it in modern English, you see, it'd say, have I ever wanted to hurt you before? Verse 30. And then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and spoke to him, and Balaam confessed his sins, verses 31 to 34. And then Balaam went on to Moab. Okay, so that's the story of Balaam and his donkey. Now, Balaam's going to Moab. So God used an ass to humble his stubborn prophet Balaam with. After beating him because he, that's the ass, in love for him, refused to move for the rebellious prophet because he saw an angel standing in the way ready to slay him, the ass spoke to him. Now, this started Balaam, and then he saw the folly of his way and repented, and God then was able to communicate with him, with Balaam. Now, what did God show Balaam? Numbers 24, verses 15 to 19. So Balaam had a vision of Israel's glorious king, the star of Jacob and the scepter of Israel, verse 17. He would destroy his enemies and have dominion over them versus over the earth, verse 17 to 19. So before Balaam could see the king, he had to humble himself and repent of his stubbornness and rebelliousness. So Balaam's donkey is also a parable in type of what God's son, the one who Balaam prophesied of, was going to do for fallen, stubborn, rebellious and blind mankind before he would become king. Jesus, like the ass, obeyed God and has stood in the way of his judgments against us and has spoken to us and warned us of coming judgment through his personal life and his written word. It's interesting to note that if Balaam's ass hadn't obeyed God three times, Balaam never would have seen the vision. How many times did Satan tempt Jesus to disobey God and forsake his mission to save us from death? Now we know that Satan was on Jesus' track every step of his life. But there are two instances, particular instances where three times Satan came to Jesus. Three times in the wilderness of temptation at the beginning of his ministry and three times in the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of his ministry. Now let's go to Genesis 49, verses 10 to 12. We didn't, we didn't have to go there, but um, this is talking about uh, Jacob blessing his 12 sons and he's going to uh, now bless Judah. And it says the scepter would not depart from Judah and that Shiloh would come, verse 10. Now Shiloh also had an ass, verse 11. He was clothed, had clothes of blood in verse 11. 
So Jacob was also shown a similar vision to Balaam. But in this vision, which was prior to Balaam's vision, Jacob sees the king binding his ass's colt to the vine. Who is this referring to? This prophecy, sorry, this is the first time a direct prophecy about Jesus refers to an ass, but there are more. Isaiah 63, verses 1 to 5. In this prophecy, the person riding the ass speaks righteousness. He is mighty to save, verse 1. His garments are dyed red, verses 1 and 2. He treads God's winepress alone, verse 3. Here in these verses, we see that the person riding the donkey is the one that speaks righteousness and is mighty to save. He was to tread the winepress alone. This person was to suffer the wrath of God against him as our sin bearer alone and then bloody his garments or shed his blood. Why? So he could save those who could not escape God's wrath alone. Who is this person? Now let's go to Zechariah 9 and verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. This is another well-known prophecy. And Zechariah 9 verse 9 reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Here we see another prophecy of this kingly person bringing redemption, riding an ass. But here it gives more description of the actual event. He was to ride into Jerusalem upon a male donkey that had never been used. Again, who is this person? Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11. So let's turn now to Matthew 21 and verses 1 to 11. Again, we know these verses very well. And when they were drew new on, just start again. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into this the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And the very great, and sorry, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes went before, and that followed, cried, saying, "Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord." Hosanna to the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. This person is none other than Jesus, the King of Israel. What was the purpose or meaning of Jesus riding on an ass? and being proclaimed king. Let's go to 1 Kings 1, verses 44 to 46. 1 Kings 1, verses 44 to 46. 
And after we look at this first, I'm going to ask a question before we, we move on. First Kings chapter 1, verses 44 to 46 says this. And the king has sent with him Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaniah the son of Jehoiada and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and they have caused him to ride upon the king's mule. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king in Gihon and they are come up from thence rejoicing so that the city rang again. This is the noise that ye have heard. And also Solomon sitteth on the throne of the kingdom. So we see here that when Solomon was anointed king, remember they tried to anoint one of other, David's son of king, but God said to David that, and he said to Israel that Solomon was going to be your king, but they tried to have one of David's other sons a king. And so Zadok the priest and, and Nathan the prophet and they knew that Nathan was a prophet, anointed Solomon king in the stead of this other son of David, and he came into Jerusalem riding upon the, the, uh, the ass. So that, that showed that Solomon was the true king of Israel. Now, it's interesting that Solomon came riding on an ass. Usually in the olden days, when people were proclaimed king or they were proclaimed as rulers, what were they actually riding on? Usually they would ride on a horse, wouldn't they? But here we see Israel's kings riding on a, a mule when they were anointed king. Okay. So Solomon was proclaimed to be king of Israel by riding him on the king's mule. As a sign to his friends and his enemies, that he was the true king. So too, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was proclaimed king in the presence of both his friends and his enemies, those he came to save. And remember in Matthew 21, it says, go to this place and say, the Lord hath need of this ass and the colt. So that ass and that colt were the Lord's mule or ass. In other words, that ass and that colt were preserved for the king of Israel. Now, in the Zion of Ages, we read this. As the procession is about to descend the Mount of Olives, it is intercepted by the rulers. They inquire the cause of the tumultuous rejoicing. As they question, who is this? The disciples, filled with the spirit of inspiration, answer this question. In eloquent strains, they repeat the prophecies concerning Christ. Adam will tell you it is the seed of the woman that shall bruise the serpent's head. Ask Abraham, he will tell you it is Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of peace. Jacob will tell you he is Shiloh of the tribe of Judah. Isaiah will tell you Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Jeremiah will tell you the branch of David, the Lord our righteousness. Daniel will tell you he is the Messiah. Hosea will tell you he is the Lord of God of hosts. The Lord is his memorial. John the Baptist will tell you he is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The great Jehovah is proclaimed from his throne. This is my beloved son. We, his disciples, declare this is Jesus, the Messiah, the Prince of life, the Redeemer of the world. And the Prince of the powers of darkness acknowledge him, saying, I know thee whom thou art, the Holy One of God. The Desire of Ages 578 and 579. Now let's go to John 18, and oh, we won't go to these verses, but in John 18, verses 33, 37, 39, and in John 19, in those verses, we read about the story of Jesus being brought to Pilate at his trial. Now, Pilate called Jesus king of the Jews, John 18, verses 33 and 39. Pilate said to the Jews, behold, your king, shall I crucify your king? Chapter 19, verses 14 and 15. The Jews said of their Messiah, 
away with him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Verse 15. And in Pilate wrote on the cross when he condemned Jesus to be crucified, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Verse 19. Now let's go to 1 Timothy 6, verses 13 and 15. 1 Timothy 6, verses 13 and 15. And it reads here, verse 13 says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. And verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is a blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So before Pilate, Remember, Pilate said, are you a king? And Jesus said, you said I am. And Jesus proclaimed himself to be the king of Israel to Pilate. Now, Matthew 26, verse 63 and 64. Now, in 1 Timothy, verse 15, it said, in the times he will show who is the only king. Now, remember, the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. Now, what did Jesus say in Matthew 26, verses 63 and 64? Okay. It says, but Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered him and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. So Caiaphas said, I, I adjure thee by living God, whether you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Messiah, whether you are the King of Israel, the Son of God. And what did Jesus say? Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said. In other words, Jesus said, yes, I am. Or well, what you have said is true. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man coming, sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So Jesus said, I am king, but you are going to condemn me as a criminal. But one day I am going to come back as king of kings and lord of lords, and you will be resurrected to see that take place. Now, these prophecies say that Jesus was to ride on the ass in meekness and lowliness, but also that he would be strong and bring salvation to the people. How could he do both? This leads us to the question, what is the main purpose of a donkey or an ass or a mule? Genesis 49 and verse 14, again going back to Jacob blessing his 12 sons, and here he's speaking to, uh, to one of his sons, or to Issachar, and Genesis 49 and verse 14 says this. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. So the purpose of a donkey is to carry burdens. Did Jesus carry burdens? Yes, he did. How many main burdens did Jesus carry? Let's now go. Oh, actually, it's two. So what are these two burdens? Or what are they? We saw, saw them before in Isaiah's prophecy. Actually, we didn't actually look at Isaiah's prophecy. I'm sorry, I didn't have that up, up on. The, oh, yes, we did in Isaiah chapter 63. Um, let's actually go there. Let's go to Isaiah 63. <coughs> Isaiah 63 and verse 
And let, let's have a look at these these verses. Um, verse sixty three. Verses 1 to 5. Actually, let's, let's just read verse 1. Who is he that cometh from Edom with thy garments from Bosra, that is glorious in his apparel, travelling in the greatness of his strength? I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Okay. So we saw in this prophecy that the two burdens that Jesus would carry was to speak righteousness and to save. Why did Jesus have to speak righteousness and save? Because of Adam's fall and the subsequent condition of lost humanity. How did he do these two things? Firstly, he lived a perfect life to show us or speak to us of righteousness. And secondly, he died for us in our stead to satisfy the claims of the broken law of God. How did Jesus do this? Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Again, verses we know very well, but let's read them. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also, I actually will stop there. And no, no, actually, let's keep reading. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and they things that are under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord or King to the glory of God the Father. In meekness and lowliness, Jesus humbled himself and was made as a man, just like you and I, and he submitted his life to the will of his heavenly Father and in all things was obedient to him, even to the death of the cross. Jesus showed us God's true character and law of love and how fallen humanity, us, you and I, can keep the commandments ourselves in the same way that he did. Now let's go to Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Again, other verses that we know very well. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Probably don't even need to go to these verses to read, read them. Jesus says here, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. What burdens are we carrying that we need rest from, that Jesus invites us to get from him, and what is his yoke that brings us rest? So now Desire of Ages, page 328 and 329 says, in these words Christ is speaking to every human being. Whether they know it or not, all are weary and heavy laden all the way down with burdens that only Christ can remove. The heaviest burden that we bear is the burden of sin. If we were left to bear this burden, it would crush us. But the sinless one has taken our place. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verse 6. He has borne the burden of our guilt. He will take the load from our weary shoulders. He will give us rest. The burden of care and sorrow also will he spare. He invites us to cast all our care upon him, for he carries us upon his heart. Beautiful quote. 
In the Desire of Ages, page 329, 330, Ellen White says, the yoke that binds to service is the law of God. The great law of love revealed in Eden, proclaimed upon Sinai and in the new covenant written in the heart, is that which binds the human worker to the will of God. If we were left to follow our own inclinations, to go just where our, our, our will would lead us, we should fall into Satan's ranks and become possessors of his attributes. Very serious quote. And brothers and sisters, this is what is going to happen to all those who do not accept Christ. Everybody who's not willing to follow God's will in their life will one day become a possessor of Satan's attributes or his character. What a horrible thought. And when we look at what's happened in the world after, over the last couple of years, we've seen people going against God's will when it comes to listening to these lies of this pand so-called pandemic and these poisons. And you've noticed how people have changed. And people who used to be friends, family members, no longer wanting to see their other family members because they didn't get this poison and so on, whereas before they did, you know. And, and what separates families? Satan. So we can see this, this um, being manifested in the world today, and we'll see it more in the future. But going back to this, this quote, if we were left to follow our own inclinations, to go, ju to go just where our, our will would lead us, we should fall into Satan's ranks and become possessed of these attributes. Therefore, God confines us to his will, which is high and noble and elevating. He desires that we shall patiently and wisely take up the duties of service. The yoke of service, Christ himself has borne in humanity. He said, I will delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, verse 38. Love for God, zeal for his glory, and love for fallen humanity brought Jesus to earth to suffer and to die. This was the controlling power of his life. This principle he bids us adopt. So this is the yoke that we have to bear to make our life easier and give us rest. But what must we be in order for Jesus to be able to do this for us? Psalm 149, verse 4. Psalm 149 and verse 4. Sorry, I'm taking so long. My, my, my Bible's got a zipper on it and it's... I had to get my fingers in there and get to the verse. Psalm 149 verse 4 says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. So we must be meek and lowly in heart like Jesus was. We must be humble and teachable as Jesus was. We must not trust to ourselves in our own ways, but to God's ways as Jesus did. We must die to self and the things of this world as Jesus did, even if it leads to death. Then and only then will Jesus give us salvation. The Zion of Ages 3.30 says we are to enter the school of Christ to learn from him meekness and lowliness. Redemption is the process by which the soul is trained for heaven. This training means a knowledge of Christ. It means emancipation or freedom or liberty from the ideas, habits and practices that have been gained in the school of the Prince of Darkness. So before we come to Christ, we had all these habits, ideas or thoughts or knowledge or whatever it might be, habits, practices and so on that we gained from the world. But now we've come to Christ, we've come unto me, we've come unto him. We've laid our burden at his feet. We're taking up his yoke. 
We're entering into his rest. And his rest means to be free from the ha ideas, habits and practices that we learnt while we're in the school of the Prince of Darkness. The soul must be delivered from all that is opposed to loyalty to God. <clears throat> and just as the ass carried the burden of wood to Mount Moriah for the offering, so did the ass carry Jesus, the King of Peace, our burden bearer and God's only begotten son through Jerusalem as he was also about to ascend Mount Moriah to become the sin offering and sacrifice, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. So that is the donkey. So, brothers and sisters, we must be meek. Oh, let me go back to this again. That is the donkey and its role that it played in the plan of salvation for us as it led Jesus to Jerusalem to become our saviour and redeemer. And brothers and sisters, we must be meek and humble and obedient and accept Christ's salvation that he brought to us when he was riding on a donkey. Now let's move on to the horse. Let's go to Genesis 47 and verse 17. Genesis 47 and verse 17. And the Bible says, And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. <clears throat> now, the reason I'm sharing this verse is because this is the first mention of Bible in the Bible of horses. So what is the purpose of a horse? Let's go to Proverbs 21 and verse 31. Proverbs 21 and verse 31. And it says here, 21 and 31 says, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. The safety is of the Lord. So the horse is mainly used for battle. And we know what a horse is like anyway. We'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> what are the characteristics of a horse? Let's go to Job 39 and verses 12, uh, 19 to 25. Job 39, 19 to 25. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He poureth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at their fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and shield. He swalloweth the ground with fierceness and, and rage. Neither believeth he that neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, ha ha, and he smelleth the battle afar of off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. So that's the characteristic of a horse. The horse, in contrast to a donkey, is proud and strong and fears nothing. He laughs at his enemies and he races towards the battle. What imagery does the Bible use of horses? In Zechariah 6, verses 1 to 5, in Revelation 6, 2 to 8, we read about the four horsemen. The white horse represents the gospel of peace. The red horse, persecution and bloodshed. 
the black horse compromise between darkness or a mixture of darkness and light, and the grey horse represented the dark ages of the Antichrist. In Revelation 9, 7 to 20, we read about the seven trumpets. And the fifth trumpet is the first woe, the sixth trumpet is the second woe, and there are horses and horsemen representing the Muslim hordes that came upon the Eastern Roman Empire. Satan was their leader in verse 11. They came as punishment against the apostate church in the Eastern Roman Empire. But the apostates would not repent of their evil in verse 20 and 21. And we'll look more about that later on. So here we see horses used in prophecy to represent the spirit of God and his angels bringing judgment and punishment upon the wicked nations, people and apostate churches who worship devils in their practices and teachings through war and conquest. Now, we didn't look at the verse, but in, in uh, chapter 9 and verse 17, it talks about uh, the mouth of the horses. So does the Bible allude to this anywhere else? Let's go now to Ezekiel 38. And we're going to look at a couple of chapters here, verses and some chapters here. Ezekiel 38, verses 14 to 16. And it says here, Therefore the Son of Man prophesy and say unto God, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou know it. And thou shalt come from the black place, out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee again against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Let's go to 39 and verse 6 and 7. And I will send a fire on my Gog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my, my holy name known in the midst of my people, Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. So Gog and Magog represent God's careless apostate people. God will send fire for his spirit to wake them up. He will send armies of horses from the north and his name will be glorified in the earth through them. Now, we don't have time to explain what all that means, but we see here that there will be an army raised to fight against God's people in the latter or last days. And horses here are symbolised as judgments or punishment against God's people. Now, this war takes place at Gog and Magog. Are Gog and Magog mentioned anywhere else in the Bible? And the answer to that is yes. So let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verses 7 and 8. Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8. And it says here, and when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So we see that God gave Gog and Magog an opportunity to hear his message and to repent. But they didn't. And now Gog and Magog are gathered together with Satan after the thousand years. So here we see that Satan, after the millennium, gathers together the lost to fight against God's people. This is a culmination of his persecution of God's people. Remember, mainly Satan is using his apostate church, the apostate Christians, to persecute God's people before 
the thousand years. Now this is after the thousand years, and it is too late for him and the wicked. They are lost, and although they gather themselves together to fight against Jesus and the redeemed, they will not win. Now, as was stated, this is only the culmination of what is taking place before the thousand years. What was happening on earth then? Let's go to Revelation 16, verses 13, 14, and 16. Revelation 16, verses 13, 14, and 16. And uh, we looked at these verses in our last Three Angels Messages sermon. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together, them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So here we see Satan and his angels using three unclean spirits coming out of the mouths, out of mouths to deceive the world and gather them to battle to war. The infamous battle of Armageddon, which we looked at in our last three angels message sermon. Who are they using? The dragon, which represents spiritualism in all its aspects, witchcraft, New Age, Eastern religion, etc. The beast, representing the Roman Catholic Church, and the false prophet, representing apostate Protestantism in all its forms. Who will they be fighting against? Revelation 19 and verse 19. Revelation 19 and verse 19. And again, we looked at this in our last sermon, but let's read these verses again. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So they're making war against someone who's sitting on a horse. So who is this one that is sitting on the horse? Let's go back to verse 11 and read from 11 to 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him with uh, him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his, his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this person sitting on the horse is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and his name is called the Word of God and Faithful and True. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 17. So first of all, before we read a little, sorry, Revelation 17, they're fighting against him that sat on horse on the horse. There was a white horse. He is called faithful and true in the word of God. He has garments dipped in blood. He judges and makes war and righteousness. And he is king of kings and lord of lords. Now let's go to Revelation 17, 12 to 14. And the ten horns which thou sawest, the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, as yet but have received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So the nations of earth give their power and their strength to the beast, which is the papacy. They all unite, united nations with the Pope as their spiritual leader. 
to war against the Lamb, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and against his people. But the Lamb, and who is the Lamb? The Lamb is Jesus, the Word of God, the faithful and true witness. Jesus and his faithful ones will win the battle of Armageddon. Amen. So Jesus and his angels will come on a white horse to fight for us against the wicked. They will be warring against God's true and faithful people in the world. These are the ones who have been proclaiming the three angels' messages to the world in opposition to those who proclaim the three unclean spirit messages. By them, they have been accounted or judged to be worthy of punishment, which is death. Now, what must God's people do at this time? Should they raise weapons and defend themselves and fight to stay alive? What does the Bible say? Psalm 20 and verse 7. Psalm chapter 20 and verse 7. says here, some trust in set chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And let, while we're on this, in this chapter, just look at verse 8 and 9. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. Deuteronomy 20. And verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The Bible says that they must remember the name of the Lord, their God. What is God's name? His character. They are to remember his character and remain meek and lowly and obedient to God, even to the point of death. God promises to deliver them. And even if we die, we'll be resurrected again at the special resurrection to see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven to deliver us. Jeremiah 23 and verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6. And the scriptures say here, In his day Judah shall be saved. And Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. The Lord our righteousness. Now I want you to keep your finger in Jeremiah 23, 6 and go to 33, 16. Because I want to bring out a couple of points, a point here. Jeremiah 33, 16. It says a very similar thing except one thing is different. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. So back in 23.6, it says this is the name whereby he shall be called. In verse 16 of 33, it says, this is the name whereby she shall be called. So 23 verse 6 is a he, which is Jesus. 33, 16 is she, which is his church. So God's church will be called the Lord, our righteousness. In other words, God's church, his people in the end, will have the same character of Jesus. They will have God's character manifested in them. 
clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final conflict. Fair as the moon and clear as the sun and terrible as an army of banners, she is to go forth in all, into all the world, conquering and to conquer. Prophets and Kings 7.25. So we are in a war, brothers and sisters. Now, we won't read this, but Joel talks about God's great army in the last days, which go everywhere in the world proclaiming the gospel. Now, let's go to Zechariah 4, verse 6 and 7. And we need to understand this verse. Zechariah 4, verse 6 and 7. Should we go forth with arms and weapons and, and all these things to fight the enemy, to stand up for God and for his truth? How are we to do it? Zechariah 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This saith the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but my, my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. So how are we going to win this battle? By the Holy Spirit and by God's grace. That's how the battle will be won. When this time comes, God's people will be holy and armed and ready to fight for the Lord. Again, not with weapons, but as we read, with his word and his spirit and his character. Let us be a part of this army, the Lord's great army. The darkest hour of the church's struggle with, with the powers of evil is that which immediately precedes the day of her final deliverance. But none who trust in God need fear. Prophets and Kings, page 725. John saw the fate of those who chose the path of transgression. What will be the wicked be saying on that day? Revelation 6, 15 to 17, we won't look at the verses, we know it. But they will call for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. Alan White says in Great Controversy 642, that voice which penetrates the ear of the dead, they know. How often, this is talking about after the thousand years, how often have its plaintive tender tones called them to repentance? How often has it been heard in the touching entreaties of a friend a brother, a redeemer. To the rejecters of his grace, no other could be so full of condemnation, so burdened with denunciation as that voice which is so long pleaded, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die? Ezekiel 33:11. Oh, that it were to them the voice of a stranger. Says Jesus, I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsels, and would none of my reproofs. Proverbs 1, 24 and 25. And why are they doing that, brothers and sisters? Because they were stubborn, rebellious, hard-hearted. They would not humble themselves and be meek and lowly. That voice awakens memories which they would fain blot out, warnings despised, Invitations refused, privileges slighted. Great Controversy 642. The voice which they heard so often in entreaty and persuasion will again sound in their ears. Every tone of gracious solicitation will vibrate as distinctly in their ears as when the Saviour spoke in the synagogues and on the street. Then those who pierced him will call on the rocks and mountains to fall on them and hide them from their face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Here Alan White is talking about the prophecy that Jesus said that one day those priests who condemned Jesus to death are now resurrected and seeing Jesus coming 
the second time in glory. Isaiah 25, verse 9. Instead of being in that situation which we just looked at in those two quotes, let us be like these people here. Isaiah 25, verse 9. When Jesus comes, we will be saying this. Lo, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Ellen White says, we all cried out, who shall be able to stand? Is my robe spotless? Then the angels ceased to sing. And there was some time of awful silence when Jesus spoke. Those who have clean hands and pure hearts shall be able to stand. My grace is sufficient for you. At this, our faces lighted up and joy filled every heart. And the angels struck a note higher and sang again while the cloud drew still nearer to the earth. Early writings, 15 and 16. Esther, chapter 6. And verse 8. Esther, chapter 6 and verse 8. Now, this is talking about um, Mordecai. So here's, we know the story of Haman and Mordecai and Esther. Haman wanted to exalt himself. He tried to destroy the Jews and he wanted himself to be exalted next to the next to um, Artaxerxes on the throne, yet he didn't realise that Queen Esther was actually a Jew. And so he wanted Mordecai and he, these, he hated Mordecai and he wanted Mordecai and his, his Jews to be destroyed. But instead, God turned it around. God worked through Esther to turn things around. And this is what it says in verse 8. It says, let the... Okay, let, let's read it. Let's go to verse 7. Because Haman honestly thought that this was going to be him. But let's, let's read from verse 6. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honour more than to myself? And Haman answered the king, for the man whom thou king delighteth to honour, let royal apparel be bought with bought which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown and the royal, the crown royal which is set upon his head, and and so on, right? And so that's what the Haman was saying for the king to do. And then the verse ten it says, then the king said to Haman. Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew, that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. You imagine the shame and the humiliation that Haman would have felt <laughs> when Mordecai was given that privilege instead of him. And brothers and sisters, praise God if we are faithful to him, even though the wicked are arrayed against us, even though they come against us with all their armies, if we are faithful to God, one day we will have that privilege of being crowned by Jesus himself and clothed in his righteousness and that white robe that we will have and we will be with the king and by his side throughout eternity. Amen. Zechariah 14 and verse 20. As I said, we're going to be looking at a lot of Bible verses today. We're almost finished, so we're coming, this is coming to the conclusion now. Zechariah 14 and verse 20. And it says here, in that day 
shall be there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. In other words, it's saying God's people will be likened to be upon the horses, pure and white. And the pots will be like the gold in the vessels, gold vessels. And Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Hallelujah. Praise God. Just as Mordecai was caused to ride in the presence of his enemies on the king's horse, so too will God's people be honoured by him in the presence of their enemies. And they too will ride upon the chariots and horses with holiness unto the Lord written upon their bells, representing the righteous character of the saints that they have gained through following the example of the meek and lowly Jesus, who is now their conquering King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. So we look at the horse. We must be prepared in order to receive Jesus' salvation that he wants to bring us when he comes riding on a horse. In conclusion, Jeremiah 4 and verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 13. And it says here, Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than the eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Ellen White says in Desire of Ages 107 and 108, To sin wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. In all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it. Then the glory of God, which destroys sin, must destroy them. Wherever men came before God whilst willfully cherishing evil, they were destroyed. At the second advent of Christ, the wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. The light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. Only as we learn from the life of Jesus when he came to the first time riding on a donkey and experience it in our own lives can we be prepared to meet him when he comes the second time riding on a horse. And if we are not prepared to meet him when he comes then, we will have to face him in all our sin and guilt when he comes the third time to set up his kingdom on earth. How will that day be for us? On which side of the city walls will you be on? What side do you want to be on? Oh, that was there. I didn't think I had that question. <laughs> the Lord Jesus pleads with us in Jeremiah 4 and verse 14. For a voice declareth from Dan, oh, sorry, wrong words. O Jerusalem, watch thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. How long shall vain thoughts lodge with thee? And Hebrews 9 verse 28 says, Jesus will soon come the second time without sin unto salvation. Actually, the whole verse says, For Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and he will come the second time without sin unto salvation. Let us learn meekness and lowliness, humbleness and obedience from the one who came on a donkey to Jerusalem to be offered there as a sacrifice for sin to bring salvation to mankind so that when he comes on a horse, to this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords to take his called and chosen and faithful to heaven and the new Jerusalem, we may be prepared to meet him and go with him to that glorious city of God. And in Isaiah 33 verse 22 says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, 
he will save us. So that is my message today, brothers and sisters, the story of the donkey and the horse and their roles in the plan of salvation that we receive through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in your love for us, you gave your only begotten Son to become the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, to die upon a cross for us so that we may have his righteousness, not our sinfulness and our wickedness and our evil and our rebelliousness. Please help us, Father, to be meek and lowly in heart as Jesus was, to humble ourselves so that your spirit may work in our lives, your will and your character, so we may be free from the entanglements of Satan and not have his attributes and not make mistakes in our lives, the mistakes that Satan wants us to make so that we will eventually be lost and even while living, go through misery and pain and hurt and so on like that. But Father, Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And when he comes back on a horse, he'll be coming in power to conquer his enemies, to conquer those who are attempting to conquer your people. But Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to be strong. Help us to have your grace to withstand whatever it is that Satan may be be uh, hurling against us so that when Jesus comes, we may say, this is our Lord. We have waited for him. This is our king and he will save us. And finally, we will have that eternal life that Jesus came to bring us and that we will live with him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity and never die. What an amazing thought. Never have temptation ever again. What an amazing thought. Never have to deal with sin and its consequences again. What an amazing thought. This is your will for all mankind, Father. Help us not to neglect this great salvation that Jesus came to give us and help us and use us, Father, to help others to see this great salvation as well. So bless us now, Lord. Thank you for this message you have given us today and thank you especially again for Jesus. And we pray these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. So thank you, brothers and sisters, for listening to this message. I pray it's been a, a blessing for us. And I'm just going to stop sharing the screen and I'll stop the recording. And if anyone wants any questions for myself or Shelley's presentation, then uh, feel free to ask.